My field of research is the history of science, which is for many people a mysterious subject. On the one hand, it's obvious to say what is science. Everybody knows what science is. On the other hand, in fact, it's very difficult to understand what science is. For instance, in different periods of time, people have called science things that today we reject as science. For instance, the theory of race. In the 19th century, racialism was a science, and today we consider it, rightly so, uh, completely abominous. So I'm working on what people consider to be science in given times. So what, what is science today? Now, I don't want to say that, that people uh, who talk about genetic determinism are the same as racial sciences. No, not at all. But certainly there are today still forms of science which are very difficult to understand outside social constraints. So I work on science in societies and I do not judge, I simply try to understand what do we call science and why. Sciences are different, are plural. My view is that science does not exist as a single body, as a single entity. There is no relationship between advanced mathematics and evolutionary psychology. So I'm trying to understand how and why we call science a variety of things that often have very little in common. Well, you see, my work, I mentioned before mathematics. My work is very abstract in the sense that, to some extent, I'm doing a scientific work because I go against common sense. So which are the applications of this kind of, of knowledge? Well, paradoxically many, for instance, in teaching, in education. But, for instance, I've done websites. One of my fields of specialty is the history of evolutionary theories. People discuss about evolution. Religious people say it does not exist. Uh, people say it is the only truth. Uh, there is an enormous amount of debates, even at the social level. So I have realized websites which are extremely successful. And I'm very pleased to say that my website, is in particular a website on a, on, a, on a French theoretician of evolution called Lamarck, uh, gets about 1,000 people a month from all over the world from North African countries to South America, United States. So I think that there is a lot of interest in understanding complexity. Often we offer people very simple, if not simplified, versions of what science is. I'm going back to what I said before. I think the usefulness of the work I'm doing, I hope at least, I hope, is to increase critical awareness. I think citizens need to understand how complex science is. Then they will make their own judgment, but they must make an informed judgment, not simply to get what the press tells them. You know, every day there are the news say, you know, a gene of immortality has been found, and a lot of people believe all this crap. So I think that by teaching people in schools, first of all, but also in the media, or through websites, through internet, how complex what we call science is, is certainly a contribution to the quality of our intellectual and social life. It is a continuation of a work that I've been doing on evolutionary theories for the first part of the 19th century. In the theories of evolution, what happens is very interesting. Every 20, 30 years, people say, the first one to say this and this was Mr. X. Before, there was nothing. From now on, everything was clear. Now, that is a continuous myth. It, it is absolutely extraordinary how very serious people really believe that, for instance, Darwin was the first, that Darwin was surrounded by creationists, and he had a tremendous difficulty in making his theories accepted. Well, the opposite is true. He had no difficulties in making his theories accepted. Well, yes, natural selection was perhaps not accepted by a lot of people, but evolution was accepted by everybody. After all, Darwin, when he died, he was buried in the Westminster Abbey. 
So in the cathedral of the Anglican Church. So it was not really opposed much, isn't it? When I die, I probably will be thrown away. Darwin was put in a cathedral. So it was recognized. The research project I have here deals also with Germany. A very important man called Ernest Haeckel, to whom we owe the word ecology. He's the man who introduced the word ecology. He was an extremely successful writer. He died at the beginning of the 20th century. And his books were translated in 92 languages. Now, nobody talks about Haeckel anymore, apart from few historians. Well, he was much more famous than Darwin for about 30 years. So the question is, why and how memory works? Because if you say, okay, a king may be forgotten, a prime minister may be forgotten, we find it difficult to accept that science can be forgotten. Because after all, science is true, isn't it? So if it is true, how can you forget it? Well, the question is that science may be true, and certainly it is very easily forgotten. So I'm going to work on evolutionary theories in the second half of the 19th century in Europe, asking embarrassing questions, that is, what were these people really saying? Why did they say what they said? Why we forget about them? How does it work that theories are presented as the final achievement of science? And 20 years later, nobody even talk about them anymore. So what is going on in science and in society when things get complex?